My name is Carlos. I'm from Orlando, Florida. I have two of my friends here from the Den. And we want to talk a little bit about how we started a Bible study in our school and how it's affected um, people on our campus. But we're not just going to talk, preach, and teach. We're actually going to have a Bible study here so that you can be equipped to go back home and start one at your school so that God can do the same thing He did through us and do it you. So before we start, can you guys bow your heads and close your eyes? Hey God, we thank you for this time that you've given us um, to just receive and learn, God, about all that you are going to want to teach us. Father, we just pray that we'd be open, and God, that you would just give us strategies to reach people in our schools, God, people that are perishing right next to us, God, people that don't know you and people that are dead, God, bring them from death to life, and Father, speak life over them in Jesus' name, amen. amen. So the first thing we do um, is we have a time of worship. But, obviously, um, you can write that down. You can have, you know, that's optional. It's one of the things that it's a Bible study. That's something that we really like to do, just to set the atmosphere. Because when you worship, you're inviting God's presence down. So the first thing we do is have, like, a 30-minute um, time of worship. Next thing I think is really important. Um, there is something on YouTube. It's called The Bible Project. When I say it'll help you, Jesus, it will help you so much. Like, guys, it is amazing. What's up, Brandon? How you doing? Good. It is amazing. It is like, it'll lay out every single book of the Bible. It'll give you like a format, and it'll kind of teach you what it is that you're reading, the context that you're reading, what it's talking about, what it means. Yes? You good? Yeah, I'm, I'm volunteering. Okay. All right. Um. So... The next 15 minutes that, like, after the 30 minutes, we have 15 minutes of testimonies, which I'd like to have right now. So, brief testimonies. Basically, we'll be sitting down, and usually it's not really you guys facing me. It's us in a big circle, and we'll be sharing what God has done throughout our week. So, can we share a little bit about what God has done in our week? If you guys can stand up, like, if you're going to speak, just stand up and speak loud. It's always interesting because in the beginning the ice needs to be broken and it's awkward and nobody wants to say anything but once it gets cold. So my name is Maris and I don't know exactly what I'm talking about. Like what like I don't know. Like your te- like a testimony of like what has God done in your life? Uh, this week. Yeah. Okay. Well, I just found out my friend is still alive. She was thinking about like. Suicide and all these other things, but I was like praying for her. God gave me different things to think about, and she's so alive and she's here today. Right now, so. Awesome. Yeah. That's a testimony right there. So we have about 15 minutes of that. So we're going to share what has God done in your life this week? What has God done in your life this week? Um, I'm Genesis. So um, before my youth group got to events, I went to Cedar Point. Um, we're from Maryland, so we drove up to Cedar Point before coming. And um, we were walking around, and you help the people at amusement parks, like talking on the microphones, and like pick out people who were just walking around. So we were like just goofing off. We were talking to these guys, and there was three of them, and they worked for the amusement park. And it turns out that only two of them knew Jesus, and the other guy didn't know Jesus at all. He never met Christians that weren't like hypocritical and rude and he was like you guys are probably the nicest people I've ever met at this piece of park ever and to hear that you guys are Christians is like weird it was like weird to him because he didn't like he knew the stereotype of Christians not you know who we actually are and so it was a good precursor for the week because you know we were learning to live like Christ and to show people God's love and we didn't even like we told him we were coming to a Christian conference but that was all that he knew about us in terms of like Jesus and so just by the way we acted, we showed him Christ, and so that was, um, I don't know, it was nice. So we always have to like preach to people, but you know, just by the way you live. Military, so he was um, 
helping with military intel and like drones and stuff. Um, so I'm just really thankful that we made it back safely. My name is Buddy. I graduated from high school 40 years ago, and when I was sitting here, I was thinking 40 is a significant number. Uh, we started a Bible study in our high school, and uh, this was in Florida. And uh, we had a small youth group, probably about five or six guys. We started meeting on Friday nights and praying all night long. And we started praying for a guy that rode our bus. Had a reputation of being pretty bad, pretty involved in drugs. We'd all witnessed to him. His name was Harvey. Harvey came to Christ, and his life radically changed. And so with Harvey, we decided we'd go talk to our principal, Mr. Collins, see if he'd give us permission to do a Bible study in our school. He told us flat out no, it was against the law. But he kept looking at Harvey because he'd had a lot of trouble with Harvey. We prayed that night. The next day, our names were called over to the intercom to come to his office. And he said, you know, it's against the law for you guys to do a Bible study in school. Yes. If you start, you're going to get persecuted. Will you give up? No. He said, listen, if more people's lives can be changed like Harvey's, here's the key to the auditorium. You can have your Bible study every morning before school. And so we started, and uh, that year we led about 50 kids to Christ. We led our basketball coach to Christ. We led our principal uh, to Christ, which was pretty awesome and amazing. And uh, so 40 years later, now I'm in a room here with you guys talking about starting Bible studies in your school. And it's like, yes! You can do it, guys. God will bless you. ones too. Um, I'm Abby, this is Abby and that's Becca. We just got done spending a week in Guatemala um, serving and um, painting a, a gym that was uh, a huge gym that was a two weeks worth a job that was supposed to take two weeks. We got done in four days and um, we just loved on kids and uh, got to you know, see part of the country as well so it's pretty neat. What part of Guatemala? No, yeah. Villa Nueva uh, is a children's home, and then we got to go to Antigua. Yeah. We were there, uh, Buddy and I we were there over spring break. We were at the time. It's awesome. Alright, for those of you that are walking in, um, we're, we're sharing testimonies right now. Um, and we're just kind of getting to know each other, breaking some ice, um, feeling comfortable speaking around each other. That's the key to having a Bible study. If you don't speak about Jesus in here, you most likely won't speak about him out there. So when it's a there's a bunch of Christians around and when you know we're all here in one accord, gathered for one reason, it's a lot easier to talk about Jesus. But in your classroom, which some of our classrooms are as big as this room, it's really hard to mention the name of Jesus, especially when everybody's actually against the name of Jesus. I don't know about where your states are, but Florida's not too um, loving on Jesus. So, I mean, if I, if I, if I mention Jesus, like, it's a big argument in our schools. So you have to really be comfortable speaking in here. And this is the key of having a Bible study, is having everybody speak. It's not elevating one person. It is not a church. I am not just pastoring and speaking. It is about everybody speaking, everybody putting input, and everybody giving some type of what God has given them. Every, every one of you has a gifting, and it's putting it all on the table and saying, God, how can you use all of us to affect our school and our campus? James, what church do you go to? I go to Cross Point. Ethan, what church do you go to? Bethel Zen. What church do you go to, John? <laughs> Elliot, what church do you go to? Our Bible study in Florida is consisted of over 20 churches. 20 churches from Baptist to Pentecostal. Our teachers come that are Jehovah's Witnesses. They come to accept Jesus. It is not just, okay, we're this denomination and we work together. Everybody else is just kind of on the outside. No, our entire school came together, like all the Christians in our school. We said, listen, there's a lot of people that are perishing right next to us, behind us, and in front of us. we got to do something about it. we got to start preaching the gospel. We have to have something, a strategy to reach them because they won't step in a church. Do you know that almost half of your campus is so callous and dry from church that they won't even step into a church? 
Most likely, if you invite them, hey, I have, I have this going on at youth group, you can have pizza, party, games. They'll be like, no, man, it's not my thing. I'm not going to go. Now, when you say, I have a community group, what's a community group? Because <laughs> we, we got a community group back home. Hey, you know what? You know, it's, it's Monday night. What are you doing? Hey, I'm doing a community group. You know, we're going to do some stuff. Um, we're going to read some stuff. <laughs> we're going to talk about some stuff. You don't get too, too specific. Obviously, we're not going to trick anybody into it. If they really want to know what we're doing, we're just going to be like, hey, we're reading the Bible. It's not a book club. It's a Bible study. We're going to be studying the Bible, not the Quran, not anything else. Just the Bible. But in the beginning, we say, hey, do you want to go to a community group? As a matter of fact, we're a nonprofit organization. We can even give you community service hours. We're actually a club. We're going to begin to be a club at school, so you can even get community service hours from joining our club, so that we can go um, help our campus as a outreach. And on top of that, you get hours for doing it. So there's strategies that you have to use if your Bible study grows in your school, so that people just are attracted to it. Because you got to get people in the door. Once you get them in the door. That's when God does the rest. That's when you just allow it to flow. Don't ever force anything. Can I tell you something? I'm going to be speaking today, and I want to tell everybody that I have never, ever had people come to my Bible study because I get pizza. Our Bible study, we don't do games or flashing lights or smoke or pizza or toys. We don't do any of that. Stuff. We don't get giveaways or gift cards. Nothing. We say, hey, man, you want to read the Bible? Come to Bible study. You want to sacrifice your Monday night or your Friday night? Come to Bible study. As simple as that. And with just seven people at our Bible study, with just seven people, a week later, this was two weeks before Momentum last year, so it's been over a year. Two weeks before Momentum with seven people. These are actually not even the original seven. The original seven would have loved to be here, but they're, they're, they're not here because they're doing a bunch of different things back home. Um, but with seven people, we started it at the house, and a week later there was 11. Like, man, praise God. Then there was 15. And three weeks later, there was 20. And then a month later, there was about 30. And then four months later, there's about 60. And then eight months later, there's about 100 students. And then a year down the road, there's 150 students, 40 people have come to Jesus because of the Bible study. What? 40 students. And I'm not talking about people that are on the line Christians. I'm talking about Muslims. I'm talking about people that do like witchcraft, which honestly it's real. Like if you guys have never heard of that stuff, people actually do like the whole witchcraft stuff and it, it's like a cultural thing. And they come to Bible study, they read God's word, they're exposed to the truth, and once you know the truth, the truth will set you free. And you see atheists, agnostics, Catholics, 20 different types of churches come together to read God's Word. I mean, it's, it's crazy, but it's happening. And it's happening because there's a void in the hearts of the people around you, and it needs to be filled. And if it's not filled with drugs or friends or what people think, it has to be filled with something else. And people are just so empty that if you just say, hey, listen, I want to invest in you. Come join our community group. We want to spend time with you. What? A few weeks ago, not a few weeks ago, man. My time is about a few months ago. Um, there was a friend of ours, and he's been a Muslim for 16 years. And he says, man, I don't go to your Bible study because I believe in the Bible. I don't go to y'all's Bible study because I care about Jesus or anything. I go because you guys actually love me. Like, this is a Muslim kid. This is somebody that came from Egypt. And he says, I go because of the time you've invested in my life. You guys love me more than my own parents do. You guys spend time with me more than my own parents do. And if anybody's going to convert me, and if I'm ever going to go anywhere, it's going to be the God that has touched you guys. Because honestly, I feel so empty from the God that I'm worshiping. I feel nothing. I have no encounter with him. I feel like I'm just alone in this. And I was like, well, we're doing something different. But it's not just inviting people. You gotta get people's trust. So, the first thing you wanna do is, hey, what's your name? Becca, I'm Carlos. You wanna come to Bible study? No, 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 no. Hey, Becca, how you doing? My name is Carlos. Um, how, how's your day been? You know, where have you come from? Tell me your story. Invest in the people around you. That is the number one key. You have to invest. 
where you reap what you sow. And if you don't sow anything, you can't reap anything. you got to sow into people's lives. You want to know a person's favorite topic to talk about? It's themselves. If you want to talk about, you want to talk to somebody, they can talk for days about themselves. Man, I've done this, and I've gone through there, and I've done that, and just let them talk, let them talk, let them talk, let them talk. And the more they talk, and the more they hear, the more they see that you're hearing them, and that you're investing time in them. Because it feels like, you know what, maybe they have never had anybody invest time, at least in our school, they've never had much time invested in them. As soon as they see that you're investing time in them, there's something different about this guy, and he actually cares about them. There's something different about this girl, and she actually cares about them. Why is it that he cares about my story? Why is it that he cares about where I'm coming from? Why is it that nobody else asks me this question and on top of that he wants to spend time with me on the Monday night at this community group? That's the open door. That's when you say, hey, you know what? Come and join the community group. And when they come in and they see Bibles open, they're already skeptical. They're like, oh, I can't read the Bible. And then we start reading and we start giving input. And we start talking about how good God is, how gracious God is, how merciful God is. They believe that the God of the Bible is a God of rules. And when people have a bad perception of God in the church is they're all hypocrites and they're all people that don't know what they're doing. They're all people that, that are just saying one thing and doing another. They're people that just follow a bunch of rules. They're a bunch of religious people. You have no idea how many lists of perceptions they have of people like us that are Christians that hold God over. But we break that perception with relationship. We have to break perception with relationship. And it all starts with investing. It all starts with sowing into their lives. And we don't reap the harvest God does. Because He's the one that changes the idea. Would you guys open your Bibles to John chapter 1? John chapter 1. What we usually do is we'll have 30 minutes of worship, and it's not a band playing in the front. Uh, we did have a, at one time a band, but it's not a band playing in this part. It's really technical. It's really complicated. There's actually just a small speaker and music. I mean, that's our worship. Like, we'll, in, we'll be in a room like this, and we'll connect the speaker, and we'll put a few Hillsong songs. Everybody will get in their little corners, have their own worship. Hey, hey God, set the atmosphere. I pray that you're glorified. I pray this, I pray this, I pray this, I pray that. And then we go into a time of testimony. We begin to know each other. Why do you think that when we come to Momentum, people, the first, the first thing that will happen that we came over here, what did they start doing? They started getting to know people. They started um, putting like music and everybody started talking. Everybody started engaging. If you don't engage before you preach, what gives you the right to invest in their life? You have to invest in their life before you preach the gospel. you got to get to know them before you can actually share your testimony and stuff like that. So get to know their story. And when we um, when we have worship, after worship, we have that time that we get to share testimonies. After testimonies, we read our Bible. So we shared a little bit. I shared a little bit of Bible study. We shared a little bit of testimonies. Now, John chapter 1. Can somebody read verses 1 through 5? Stand up. Speak loudly. Speak clearly. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was light, and that light was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. Yeah, so where do you read verse 6 through 15? Okay. God sent a man, John the Baptist, to tell about the light, so that everyone might believe because of his testimony. John himself was not the light. He was simply a witness to tell about the light. The one who is the true light, who gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He came into the very world he created, but the world did not recognize him. He came to his own people, and even they rejected him. But to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. They are reborn, not with a physical birth, resulting from human passion or plan, but a birth that comes from God. So the Word became human and made His home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. And when and we have seen His glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. John testified about Him when He shouted to the crowds, This is the one I was talking about when I said, 
Someone is coming after me who is far greater than I am, for he exists among you. Amen. So, pretend we read the whole chapter. Pretend we read John chapter 1. We usually do it by section, so if you look at your Bible, can I borrow your special Testament connection? So when you look at your Bible, the first it says the eternal world, the eternal word. You guys see it? The eternal word? Then you're going to scroll down and it says John's witness, it, John's witness the true light. You guys see it? Then you have the word becomes flesh, right? Then you have a voice in the wilderness, the Lamb of God. So there's a chapter, but in the chapter there's different sections. And what I think would be a lot easier, especially when you're going to talk about it and kind of understand what it is that the Bible is saying, you do it by sections. We have a bigger group, we do it by chapter, but to start off, we did it in sections. And I think that's the perfect way to start off because you get to break it down a lot easier. So based on the 15 verses that we just read, I went up to 15 because I wanted to go up to where it says the word became flesh. What stood out to you in John chapter 1? We're going to have a Bible study right now. What stood out to you in John chapter 1? What stands out to me is the eternal exist existence of Jesus. Because he was in the beginning. And uh, he didn't start with the virgin birth. He was already in existence before that. That's good. Um, I like verse 5. It says, The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. It just like reassures me that God's you know, power is you know, infinite, and that you know, no attack of the enemy or anybody else could you know, extinguish his, his power and his light. Are you guys um, speaking? Do you like stand up? Thank you. What stood out to you? There's a lot of, a lot of good points that you can take out of John. Verse 8, when it says John himself was not the light, he was simply a witness to tell about the light. Because um, we relate to that. Like, that's what we are. People are supposed to tell about the light, but we aren't. Yeah. I like it in verse 1 where it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So, if you skip down to verse 14, I believe, it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So the Word was with God, the Word was God, and the Word being God, God became flesh. So it shows you that Jesus became flesh. Jesus being God became flesh like us. And that's how, you know, you know the rest of the, the story that he went with, was crucified and all, but the Word, which is God, came and became flesh to dwell among us. Let's get five more points in, and then we're going to talk about everything over there. What stood out to you, John chapter 1? I like um, verse 14, that it says, Jesus came, in other words, uh, became flesh, and it says, they came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And um, I think those are the two the things we wrestle with as believers, grace and truth. So we have to, we stand out for truth, because we, this, how God revealed himself, this is the word of God, and it's true, but at the same time, there's grace. I think that's what we bring to the world. We, say, we, we bring them truth, but we also bring grace. So there's, that's where forgiveness comes in, and that's where new life comes in, and restoration of God. You know? So I, I really like that, how God combines both. You know, and Sometimes people just see one aspect, it's just got to be, it's all about truth, you know, we've got to proclaim the truth. Sometimes it's all about grace, but God combines both. Grace and truth in Jesus Christ. Yeah. Good. <clears throat> Verse 3, when it says, All things came into being by Him, and apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. So, like, I think it shows us that, like, if people don't know what their purpose is, that, like, nothing came into being without His plan coming on purpose. So, like, what it is, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> well, we're here for a reason. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Have the them go like this, someone's on fire, and they're preaching. You gotta cool them down. <laughs> working through them. So, 
shout out to that, shout out to that, shout out to that. <laughs> we just gotta cool each other down, because God is doing something. What else, guys? Get three more in. Um, I like verse 12 and 13, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. For we're not born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. I just think that's awesome how, as we have received him, we're, we're not nobodies. And it's awesome how we're talking about identity and like our identity in Christ because we have accepted him because of what he's done. We are not just... We're not nobodies, we're not just creations, but we're sons. And there's so much intimacy in, just, in being a son. So I think that really stood out to me, how we're just sons. That's awesome. Okay. That's good. There we go, there we go. You guys are getting the hang of it. I like verse 3, I think somebody said it already. But, um, all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So, the way I perceived it was, Everything in this world was made by God. Everything that's beautiful, everything that's amazing, God created. I'm, I'm looking at a tree that's absolutely green and vibrant. I'm looking at water that's shining from the sun. God created that. We're here living. Let's go one more. Who stands out to you?
have, we all have the same mission, vision and mission, and we are out to reach all the students in our school. And I think it's safe to say that in Lake Nona High School, where we go to, there's not a single senior that did not hear at least the name of Jesus or get invited to us. And that's phenomenal because people who graduate high school without even knowing who Jesus is. People who graduate high school without even knowing the name of Jesus. <clears throat> but because of what you can do at a Bible study and what, because of what you can do at a community group, you can really make an impact on the lives of your parents. So, lastly, um, you want to know the secret? There's, there's three little secrets that you guys need to write them down. Um, I want to let everybody at home them know. Man, there are some secrets in the kingdom of God that they're there, and we can read about them, but we don't always use the secrets that God gives us, the secret tools that God gives us. The first thing we do is prayer walks. You know what a prayer walk is? Yeah. If you've done prayer walks, raise your hand. It is where you are proclaiming life over your community. And you can look like a fool, you can look crazy, but we walk down our streets and we say, God, you're moving here. And we speak life. God, I know that nobody in my classroom knows Jesus, but I know all of them are going to know Jesus. I know that this girl, they, she's been called ten different names, but God, I know you're going to reach her, and this guy's in drugs, but God, I know you're going to reach them, and this guy is so deep into thinking God does not exist, but God, I know that all things are possible to you, and I know you're going to reach him. And it's not, oh, that person, yeah, he's never going to come to Christ. Oh, that person, bro, you should see what, what he's done. Oh, that person, no, we can't be like that. I think the first step in the revival that God has, that has taken place in our school is we didn't care who you were. We said God has a plan and a purpose. God loves you. You're chosen. We speak life over you where you are saved. You are righteous. You are loved. And we just started speaking, 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 speaking words of life. And you know what we were doing? We had a bag of seeds and we were just... We were just throwing seeds everywhere. We were just speaking life, speaking life, speaking life, and throwing seeds. And you know what? God was in charge of allowing that seed and making that seed grow. It's not our, that's not our role. We just preach the gospel. We just plant and throw seeds. God is in charge of the harvest. He knows when they're ready. But our job is to at least plant the seed, man, Jesus loved you. Man, that's a powerful seed. Because they, a lot of students in your schools have not even heard that Jesus loves them. They think that Jesus is going to judge them. They think that when they go to church, they're going to have to repent and they're going to have to do all these things, which they're going to have to. But they think that they're going to be like hypocrites and they, they just have a bad perception of what it is. But start planting seeds of hope, seeds of faith, seeds of righteousness in their life. Another thing, man, this is power, power, power. You know... We started receiving numbers, and we started receiving people, which is not about numbers or people. It's about intimacy. It's about having disciples. But we started to see, seeing disciples, make disciples, make disciples, make disciples, by doing this, right? God, I know I have needs, and I know I want this, but God, I know this person needs that. And it was waking up early in the mornings, early in the mornings, and we have a prayer team. And who's on that prayer team? Right? Are, are any of you on the prayer team? I forget. That week that we prayed, how many were us? There were like 10, 14 of us? That prayed that week, that one week, that God put on our hearts to pray and to fast for our, our school. We began to pray, and we woke up at 5 o'clock in the morning or 6 o'clock in the morning, and we just began to pray everybody at our school. How many people were at the den the next week? I don't even think we had seats. And it's a place like, like this. I'm talking like over 80 students. You know what over 80 students that are not Christian? Probably half of them were not Christian. You know what that is? But it all started when we're speaking like we're throwing seeds. We're praying for the seeds that we're throwing. And then the third one is we speak life Plant seeds, and the third one is having faith that God is going to provide the growth. That God is going to provide the increase. Have faith. You know what was frustrating at first? 
bro, I'm pouring into you, and man, God is going to change you. And, and the guy will be like, yeah, man, I'm changing. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. I just accepted Jesus. I'm so excited. And yeah, bro, I'm going to be here for you. And like two months down the road, the kid in the seat, like I catch him at a football game, and he's doing something he shouldn't. And he's like, nah, man, I don't really care about that anymore. And then they're like, oh, God. He's going to just fail and he's not going to make it. He's turning his back away. Oh, I already know. He, I knew he was going to turn his back away. We didn't have that attitude. We have so many people that have been on the verge and we're just speaking life, speaking life, and having faith and planting seeds. And we're just going in. It's an ongoing process. And we're just right there next to them because that he that has accepted Jesus is like a brother or sister to us. And just like you would want your brother and sister to know Christ and go after them, we go after it the people around us in our circle. So, overall, guys, just be very open to everything. Um, the best, best, best place to start it is at your house. It's at your house. Um, ladies, if you guys are planning to do a Bible study, it'd be even safe to say, have, have a women's Bible study. You know, have something that, that girls in your school would be able to go and just feel safe and feel confident that you're not going to judge them, but that you're going to love them. And before you talk to them about God and stuff, invest time with them. Hey, let's go grab some coffee. Hey, let's spend time together. Let's do this. Let's do that. And then, hey, I'm not going to invite you to my youth group yet. Or somebody that you've invited to your youth group. If they say no, just be like, hey, we got a community group. The people that go to your youth group, that's amazing. You can have them come to your youth group. But there's a lot of people that would be like, no, you guys probably know that. They come to my youth group. So invite them to this community group, and there you get to just come together. And what did we just do as we read John? We talked about how good God is, what God has made, what God has done. It was all positive, positive, positive. Did we say, God says he's going to rain down fire if you don't know? We didn't say that. We didn't say that. We were talking about the goodness and, the, and God's grace and, and how beautiful everything is. And those type of things are what people never hear, but that they can hear if you do start talking. So, that and um, I think the last thing is, is having faith. It's not about numbers. If you have a Bible study of five or six, God bless you. That's amazing. Like, that, those six are, I pray that you guys would, you know, plant into each other and just grow with each other and be disciples and be firm. Be firm in your word. If people come and they're saying some craziness, have a leader come and clear it up. We had that in the beginning. I think our case is like really crazy, so I'm not even going to say it. But for you guys, if you guys start something, I think it would be really powerful. I recommend you just get a little speaker. I know we read. You can read too. Just get a little speaker. Download the Bible app. Press the play button. You know, they have like the recording. Press the play button. Do the first half. Speak about it. Talk about it. Engage. Do the second half. Maybe do one chapter. Have a Bible study that's an hour long. Try to do it a day that people are free. You know, like Mondays, nobody's really doing anything. So, you know, let's do it on Mondays. And then from there, you have more availability. And God can really move to you. It's not just Juan Carlos and Florida. No, no, no. Like, God can move to you. You just have to be available. Are there any questions? I've used the Gospel of John a lot in, in just discipling or, or reaching out to people. And I'm, try, I'm planning on teaching our youth to do the same same thing. But my approach was more like one-on-one. -on -one. Like grab a friend, basically ask them, hey, do you want us to read the Bible together? So what's the benefit of, of the change or whatever between doing it one-on-one -on -one versus group? Have you ever have you done either one? or? Yeah. Um... Because one on one, you can say, "Hey, let's just meet over lunch or uh, cafeteria, Starbucks, wherever kind of thing." And it's a group. It, it's just less formal in a sense, you know. Than, yeah. yeah. And the other one. What's well, for us? Is, it's not too formal because it's in a house. So. Yeah, but you gotta make the effort to get there versus if, if you grab them at school, say, and you just have a study hour, or whatever. Yeah. Do it right then, you know. I know for us. Um, People feel a lot more comfortable if there are other people, especially non-believers. So non-believers, if you say, hey, let's have a one-on-one -on -one talk about Jesus, like, no. <laughs> like, they, they, like I, I, at least where we're from, they will flat out tell you that. Because they're going to say, well, why do you want to talk to me? What are we going to do? 
and they're just going to listen to like, be like, hey, you know what? So when we come into a setting, and when we're an outreach group that goes, because sometimes we don't even have outreach, we'll just go out to the community. When we're an outreach group and there's like a group of us, there's so many things that we can do that it just gives a, a better um, wide range of things um, that we're capable of doing. Another thing I like about groups is I read John chapter 1 and I pull out five things. We all read John chapter 1 and we pull out like 40 things. Does that make sense? There are things that God can reveal to you out of Bible study. And I'm like, wow, I didn't even look at it like that. I didn't even see it like that. I didn't even know that it was talking about this. And like, maybe not a huge group, but just like, let's say like us seven or six, that's perfect. That's perfect because we just come together and can you believe that people in their youth group have never really even opened up their Bible? So the pastor will be preaching and they'll have like three or four Bible verses. Oh, that's good. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. But they never get into their Bible. So when the enemy comes and when there's oppression and when there's, when there's depression, when there's <clears throat> problems and situations, where do I go to? My own words? That's why we want to get into the Bible so that we can go to the Bible. And um, I think that's the benefit of having like a little group. But one-on-one, -on -one, I encourage it a lot. It's awesome if you invest time into the person. Well, it would be someone that might have built a relationship like yeah, before yeah. Five, that's, go through high school kind of. Yeah. yeah. But now be be more, um, specific, I mean, um, intentional that relationship. You know, so encourage them to do, do that. that and I think that's the biggest part. Is if you're doing one-on-one, -on -one, you have to build a relationship. Because okay. flat out, we we don't we just go up to people we don't even know. <laughs> We just be like, hey man, you want to come to community group? But like, if it was like a one-on-one, -on -one, like it had to be like a time. So yeah. yeah be good both. Any other questions? Um, well, no, yeah. Well, I mean, it's not really funny. a lot of people wonder, um, what's the best book to start? To start a community? I do not recommend starting Leviticus or Exodus <laughs> or like any of that stuff. Deuteronomy. <laughs> Um, I would definitely recommend starting the New Testament and starting in a book like we just started with John. We started, we started with Paul's letters because we were receiving 20 different churches and some people were like, you got to do this, you got to do this, you got to do that. And I was like, you got to read Paul's letters. You got to send Paul has to stay alone. So we did that, but honestly, like I said, it's a rare case. So I think you guys would be great if you started in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Um, just one of the Gospels. Just to see how God, just to see like God's goodness, and just to really read about how good God is. Now, as a Bible study, is it just a Bible study? You can do so many things with a Bible study. I wish I had a marker, honestly. I, I was, out of a Bible study, you can branch off a prayer team, like we do. You can have a team that is devoted. Hey, we have this problem. My aunt is sick. Our prayer team will go to your house and pray. But it's a community group. And we have a prayer team branched off of that, that literally we're planning on even going to prisons and speaking to people. Obviously, you've got to be 18 in order for that. But we have even college students that are like, you know what? Let's go and be able to preach in the prison. Let's go and pray for people. Let's go. If someone is sick in, in, in the hospital, let's send part of the prayer team. Then we have an outreach team. We go into downtown Orlando with the den shirts, and we go with care packages. And we're not just handing it out, oh, peace out, you don't have a nice day. No, we're building a relationship. We're saying, hey, man, tell us your story. We'd like to tell you a little bit about what we know and the testimony of our lives, which is through Jesus Christ. And then we invest in them. They, they, we speak to them, we invest time with them, and then we say, God bless you. And we give it. That's our outreach team. And then we have... We had a worship team, but I honestly recommend if it's a Bible study, just have like the speaker, it's a lot easier. Um, then we have like an organization team. When you get there, have Bibles, have like, there's so many organizations that will help you out. Crew, you know what crew? Anybody heard of crew? We told crew, hey, we have a Bible study, da, 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 da. set us 200 Bibles. The American Bible Association, hey, we have a Bible study, 200 Bibles. There are organizations out there that if you knock, the door will be open. And it's just about getting out there and being like, hey, you know, we need so, so many Bibles. When you have seven, eight people, that's fine. Everybody just brings their own Bibles, or you just buy a few at the store. Now, if you begin to grow, start contacting people. Start asking people, hey, or, you know, we need 
it's such and such resource, can you provide it? Most people will say yeah. So. I just started a uh, Bible study in our school last year. Um, and as a teacher, we're not supposed to, you know, share our beliefs and things like that. So um, with a 20 to 25 minute, and we actually do it during the school day. It's not like it's part of our club time. Um, this is all good. Um, is it something that you promise to do like a section? Like what would you do in that 20 minutes? I just do the section. That do the sections. Honestly, like have a time for them to speak and get to know each other. Uh -huh. um, that's like essential. Right. Especially when we were just talking about it's essential to look at relationship. And then once you feel that the ice is broken, because mm -hmm. if you just go straight into read God's word, it's going to be crickets. So, <laughs> but if you get to know each other and they're comfortable with each other, and then you get to God's word, it will flow. It will really well. So I recommend maybe 10 minutes getting to know each other. People usually walk in late anyways. Right. 10 minutes to know each other. The last 20 minutes. You know, just kind of reading the passage. We have teachers that are on your covers too. I'm sorry. <laughs> we have teachers that. Yeah, I kind of had to recruit a couple <laughs> students to go talk to administration yeah. because it's it was in our middle schools, but it were it wasn't at the high school level. Yeah. And I mean, I was the same way. I started out with maybe like four people, and then by the end we had like 30 by the end of the school year. Oh, so wow. it was pretty. I mean, they're not coming every week, but they're they're on the list and they're coming when they can because they're splitting their times up with other clubs. But it's uh, it's been pretty pretty good. We have a shirt now, so we're going to be out there for the school. So um, yeah, it's a lot, but it's really good. What we're doing is making it a club. Mm -hmm. If the Muslim Association can be a club, so can the dead. so can a Christian organization. And what we do is we have our shirts as well, and. Just spread love and speak truth. <laughs> yeah. And it just gives a lot better of a, you have so much more leverage when you're a club because then you can give community service. And what can turn into, it's not really double sided, but when they go in one intention, God can really just change the world. I mean, like, well, their, their, their intention is to go help people, but they also need to be helped, and that's when you have to make a big difference. It's about the worship. Um, I can see how that works in the bigger group, but in a group of four and five, doesn't that seem sort of like forced I, debate if you wanted to yeah, take for play there? I don't, like I said, it, that's optional. I mean, we do it because it was like people were requesting it. So people were like, hey, you know what? There's 30 of us, 40 of us. We'd like to have some worship. And we were so, but you didn't do it initially? Oh, no. In the beginning, we did Okay. No, no, no. okay. In the first few weeks, we didn't at all. It was just something along the way that by the request of the students. This is student-led. Okay. There's not a single though. So with the request of the students, we're like, all right, let's do it. Like, let's let's have a little bit of worship. We started with maybe one or two songs, and then we ended up with about like three up to now. But in a smaller group, I recommend just getting to know each other and going straight to God's Word. The dialogue would be amazing. So. Yeah, because of my small group, or you know, my time restraint, I play the worship songs as they're coming in the door. Like, and so then that's yeah. kind of like getting their mind ready. Or having it in the background as you speak just like a little bit yeah. low. That, that works too, especially if you're in the classroom. We have teachers that, um, man, our campus is amazing. Like our crew headquarters is in our, in our community. And most of our teachers are Christians. They just obviously can't express it because they get in trouble for that. But they're like, man, we'll host your clubs, and on this day you can come over here, and as a club you guys can situate your Bible study here in the mornings. So we're not only thinking about having Bible study on Mondays, we're also thinking about having Bible studies in school at a teacher's room. But it's a community. You gotta know how to be smart about that stuff. So that's how you're. If you're gonna do it at school, that's how you're gonna do it. What else, guys? Yeah, today. Go. Nobody else is going to ask. <laughs> yeah, that's right. uh, who owns this in the sense, um, it, let's say you, you started it and you move on uh, after high school, college, whatever, move out of state, whatever. Uh, how, how do you facilitate ongoing growth for, for this? You know, Have you thought this through? Or? Yeah. Well, I just graduated high school and uh, we are going from, it's a Bible study of high school and college students. So we make up with a lot of college students as well. Um, John, Ethan, and Ellie, and uh, James, 
those, these three guys had not graduated. So I'm passing the baton to them <clears throat> so at the high school they can recruit more students and at college <laughs> And in, in, the, in our college, our college just happens to be right next to our high school, which is kind of weird. But it's right next to it, so as they're recruiting from the high school, we are reaching out to the college. So it kind of works both ways. We don't go as far as middle school, because it's, you know, different members, like matters of, I mean, we can do middle school, but it's not like, we just personally don't do it. There's not many middle schoolers that are actually taking God serious. We're trying to reach them, and we put a lot of them So, age group, pass the time. I believe that the seniors, um, being the top dogs, should really take the responsibility of being leaders in your school. So if you're going to be a junior or a, or a senior, um, you really got to take the role of responsibility and, you know, setting an example. So did you, towards the end of this school year, did you let others lead then? Yeah. Elliot so, preached, or uh, Elliot led and preached, because at the end we have like a five minute sermon. So uh, we, we also, what, what I love about it is we'll be in a big circle, but I'm not the one speaking. Because usually at a church, you just have a pastor speaking. At this Bible study, everybody's giving input. So when we go and spread the gospel, I'm not leading, and I'm not the only one speaking. Everybody's speaking because they're so used to speaking instead of the Bible study. So. Elliot has led it, Raphis has led it, um, Josh has led it when he's preached. So I like to pass it, and you know what leading is? It's basically, um, what's it out to you guys? Like that's really all it is, because it's an input that everybody gives. So it's not, I know for me right now it's because I'm kind of showing you what I do, like what we do over there, but in general, it's not just one person leading, because what happened is, the problem, what, what I would run into is, I go and I go to this church, so I'm the one leading, and that means we follow up to this church. No, it can't be like that, because that way, that would be kind of a problem, because there's so many different people in so many different churches. So I just sit down, and I just supervise everything. Um, but as far as leading, I mean, I'm passing the baton. To the word is facilitate. Facilitate, yeah. But I'm um, passing the baton to the students, and let's see what God does with so as you grew, you split off into homes, different homes. You're not 150 groups sit, sitting in a circle. Yeah. As you said, you grew to 150. So then, what's your max size that you say we need to split? Um, well, what happens is, my, my mom had like 70 people. She was like, we can't do this anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and our living room is not this room. It's actually not even half of this room. It's actually about a quarter of this room. And imagine 80 people. It was a mess, but God was being glorified. It was really awesome. Um, what happened is, we went to the middle school. We went to our local middle school, talked to the principal. They gave us a form. Within weeks, that was full. And we we're like, oh man, like God, we pray that you really provide a bigger place because this is just gay. Because what are we going to say? Don't come. And then if we split off two different Bible studies, which we were thinking of doing, um, it was just the right timing, you know, God was saying something else. Um, we were just thinking that it would divide and stuff like that. So, we were at the middle school group, and then we were about to, the, the contract for the middle school ended. We went back to my house, my mom got mad again. She said, listen, you guys need to just leave. Like, just have it outside or something. And then, I called a bunch of churches, and there's liability issues, and there's this, and there's that, and but then finally, a church, um, like a Baptist church, called us and they said, You can use our building. This is Baptist Church of Lake Park. Well, you guys can go ahead and come in. And we're like, Sweet. And they had pews, kind of like how you guys are sitting right now. So it's really hard to be in a circle. So what we did is, there's five people per pew. We usually try to do four people per pew, and you guys are a team. We did it by teams, essentially. So we have 10 pews here and 10 pews there. And they'd be four with five people in each pew. But this group of five, it's like basically you guys quitting together and all having your word. We all still play it on the speaker so that everybody hears it, but the dialogue will be your team. That makes sense. So we all will read it together, but the dialogue will be through your team. 
which is where you're sitting with. And the number one thing is, don't sit next to your friends. Like when there was a lot of people, we say sit next to somebody you've never sat next to. And they'd be people that you never talk to, but that you're speaking to about God, which is pretty awesome. Um, so I know, like in my school, we put and my school is like really, really big, but our FCA has like no people. But um, we started to like, I guess, like get like people to come in, but most of them are athletes because it's FCA. But um, people, I guess it's weird because the like, people in my school, like you touched on it earlier, like people like know the language, they know like what to say in the Christian meeting, and then like outside of it, they're not living like that, like whatsoever. So how do you kind of like approach that? Because it's like you can't say don't come to the club anymore, but also like the people who aren't Christians who are coming to the club or seeing them outside the club not like added up, so like how do you kind of like Can I be honest? That? I think I fall in the category of one of those people until I started reading each other. And it was in the development of not telling him not to come to the club. Keep coming to the club. We're reading God's Word. And God's Word is going to speak to you. And eventually we're reading and I feel conviction. I'm like, man, <laughs> we're reading about this. We're teaching about this. We're giving input about this. And I'm actually dealing with so there has to be a change. Now, if you see it further and you see that they're causing division, I've had to be like, like there was a few guys that came, oh, they started coming in and they were like, you know, the law says this and you can't eat that. There, When I say there's different people from everywhere, like we got people from like churches that no, nobody's ever even heard of. And they started coming in and saying certain things. And that's when we had to stand firm in what we believe, and which is the foundation of what, who Jesus is to us, and we had to say, you know what, although you believe this, you can start your own group with all respect, I'm sorry. And when you have to, and that's, Matt was my position as what he says as a leader. I didn't really stand out in speaking, I stood out in, hey, this is what we're following. You know, we're going to read, we're going to do the Bible project. So if you look up, the first thing you should have wrote is the Bible project. This will lay out every single book of the Bible with drawings, like basically, can somebody get their phone out and look at the Bible Project real quick and look it up on YouTube. Um, and the Bible Project will basically give a layout of what it is that you're reading to make it a lot more comprehensible, if I'm saying that right, to everybody else. So it's a really, really, really helpful tool so that there's not really confusion. It talks about the context, it talks about you know what you're reading, why it's being said, what's being done, what's being heard. But yeah, uh, I would recommend, you know, we have a core group of leaders, right? I don't make decisions. We have 15 leaders or something like that. And 15 leaders are overseeing everything that happens in the Bible study. So if something comes out, you know, like out of control, we have our leaders and we have meetings. We discuss, what do we do if this happens? What do we do if that happens? What are, what's the next book we're going to read? How are we going to approach this book? What are we going to talk about? What are we going to do with the teams, the prayer team, the outreach team? We talk about everything as leaders. So I would recommend, if it's a small group, don't do the whole leader thing, because then you're going to feel like you're excluding a few students. Because there's seven of, a, seven of you and four of you are leaders, it, it'll kind of be like harsh on the other ones, because it'll be like, wow, so you four are leaders, but we're not qualified to be leaders. And that's when you kind of run into division. But when you grow to about over 15, you know, God really blesses the Bible study that you started your school. If you go to over 15, I recommend that you get a solid group of about three or four leaders that are grounded and that really understand God's word and that are willing to do that. Share no. I don't. 
We don't ever talk about who's the leader. Matter of fact, a lot of people don't even know. But you pick a core group of people that are there, that are committed. Don't just pick a leader that's going to be there once a month. Be someone that's committed and be like, you know what, I'm going to devote my time to this. This is the Bible project. And basically, I'm just going to show you like five seconds. happens to be like in class. 
we have like a lot of classes that have debates and stuff that don't end up without like, you know, like modern topics and stuff. You have to make sure that it doesn't become like you like fighting with them about because you like you want them to believe what you believe so bad but it doesn't give you the right to, you know, like degrade them or degrade what they believe because you don't believe it. You know, so you have to make sure that you respond in love. So even in saying, I don't believe what you believe, you're still showing God's love to them. Like God loves them even though they don't give a crap about him, you know, so we have to represent that. That's good. That's good. What would you do? Would you tell would you tell them right there in front of everybody that he's wrong? Would you stop him from talking? Would you send them out? What would you do? Uh, remember what you thought of? You throw a rope that's not rock. You throw a rope that's not rock. And I think what he said was exactly what we do. There has been people that have come, like, and they are just negative. And they will come in and say, this is wrong, we gotta do this, we gotta do that. And in front of everybody, I didn't say, I'm the leader of this Bible study. And you need to stop. No, no, I didn't say that. Let them talk. Let them talk. I said, hey man, this is not a book club. This is a Bible study. If I gotta call it out like that, I will. And then at the end, when he says, pull him aside, you might, you might if we get something in Panera, get something to eat, grab, grab a cup of coffee, let's talk about that. And if we don't come to terms there, maybe it's best that you don't show up and create confusion. So, we say that very lovingly. I've had to say that, unfortunately, at least a hundred times. I've had to say this over a hundred times. They have just come in with like, different doctrine, different beliefs, and they just want to mix it all. Uh, and you know, God's word is not twisted. It's, it's very straightforward. And very lovingly, I have to say, I'm sorry, but I think you would be better than other people. supposed to 
to be the light of the world. So the way you, you the way you go into the school can make a huge difference on who you can affect. You know who was hardest for me to reach? The people that I knew before I was a Christian. Oh man. Because they already knew what I was doing before I was a Christian. Not them in specific, but these two guys. And they knew who I was. And when I invited up to Bible study, bro, you got a Bible study? No, weren't you just doing this the other day? That makes sense? That's really, really tough. But you got to keep going to you. you got to keep going to you got to have faith that God provides the increase. What's another scenario? Um... What happens if there's eight people in the Bible study and only three show up? You still have to cancel the class. You still have it. There's two people, you still have it. If it's just you, read your word. <laughs> but you can't give up. You can't give up. There were times, like SATs, like our beginning of October, so they're probably like from 40, 50 people, to like six people. Like, all right, <laughs> glorify God, let's go, let's read our word. Let's, <laughs> we're going to do the same thing, we're not going to change it because of number. And sure enough, in November, everybody came back. In December, everybody came back. But you gotta, you got to maintain consistent, have endurance. What time is it, sir? 1045. We'll do it all the way down. So, what else, guys? Phones. Like, I don't want to be like, hey, like, I'm going to get on their phones, but I mean, like, it's respect. Yeah. And, like, when someone gets on it in the middle, I don't want to, like, call them out and be like, hey, you know, turn it off. But, like, what I would do is have actual Bibles. Um, try to have the same translation. So, there's one confusion. ESV Bibles. If you're going to have four or five people, have five Bibles. Hand out a Bible. Be like, hey, guys, so let's give this one hour to God without having any distractions. I guess the last few minutes, I just want to talk about what are your plans? What are your plans? You came here for a reason. What are your plans starting a Bible study? I should see at least one. What are your plans?
they're not gonna want to talk about you. They're gonna want to eat your pizza and leave. <laughs> Guys, you can do it all the time. And be focused and centered on that. Now, once you have that core group, yeah, those quads, but we have to focus on Jesus. We don't have to focus on.